morning, everyone. We're just getting started here. Uh, we're joined by Dina Eppenshed from the Leadership Institute. She is the director of coalitions. Uh, she's a, a veteran of many campaigns. Uh, she's been a lobbyist in South Dakota and DC and campaigned in Florida, South Carolina, Kentucky, and worked as a paid activist in Alaska. In her current home state, she ran a ballot access and get out the vote efforts during the primaries for Donald J. Trump for president in 2016. Uh, one of the projects that has made a lasting impression on Dina was working with parents in Sioux Falls as they fought back against graphic sex ed in the classroom, which I know will hit home with a lot of our parents on here today. So Dina, thank you so much for joining us and uh, ready to get started. Thank you so very much. I'm glad to have you guys here. Um, I just want to check on something. If I do this, did that interfere with the share screen at all? No. Okay, good. I like uh, making eye contact with people when I speak in the little Zoom secret professional thing that usually ends up being looking at myself when I speak, but at least I'm making eye contact with the person. I wanted the little video up there. So let's get started. So um, I've got about 20 years of experience in some sort of grassroots organizing or campaigning. And, um, and that's what I'm bringing for you today. So I know we've only got a about a little less than an hour. And so I want to get started and get started quickly. And again, if you've got any questions, go ahead and put them into the chat and I will answer them as we go along the way. So I want to start off this presentation by talking about budgeting and then we're going to finish it off with some fundraising advice. Because really where we begin um, your campaigns, first we need to know what the heck we're running for. You need to know what your strategy is to win and then you need to know how much it's going to cost you to win. Um, our budgets, and I want you to type in there, if you've already worked on a budget or if you've figured out how much it's going to cost you to win, please type in and let us know um, what size of a campaign you're going to run. Like some people, I was in Rhode Island a couple of weeks ago doing one of these and the woman said, oh, well, my campaign budget's only $2,500. And I was kind of shocked that it was so low uh, because it just seems like her district would have more people than just a $2,500 person district. Would in fact, even though she was running, you know, for a rather large city, her district boundaries were quite small. So she didn't have to turn out that many people to vote. Um, and then last weekend, you know, I was out in Washington and we were talking about 10, 15, 20. And I've been with somebody who had a $100,000 budget running for school board. So obviously that's a big difference between a $2,500 school board race and a $100,000 school board race. Frankly, with all of the experience and all of the focus that the conservative parents are putting on school boards right now, I am betting that the races for school board are probably going to get more and more expensive. So I'm glad that you're here today learning how to run a professional race, learning how to do this properly, and then um, learning what it takes to win. So let's talk about some of these things when it comes to budgeting. Um, so failing the plan is planning to fail, right? So this is why we start with budgeting, because if you don't know what you're spending money on, you don't know how much you need to raise, you don't know what to do. Um, this is a little video. I'm only going to show you part of it, but it's kind of a fun way to express why we need budgets. Wow. And let me know if you don't hear. Low account balance. How is that possible? Oh no. Not again. Kelsey. Hey, check. I deserve I need that. Shots on me. You're literally wearing this shirt right now. I need Kelsey, this one. No, you don't. I don't have no, this you don't. exact one. Extra large pepperoni with pineapples. Let me get pad thai and chicken teriyaki. $5 delivery charge? That's fine. So oftentimes on campaigns, we do this, where we were like, oh my gosh, look at all this money coming in. Let's go ahead and buy these yard signs. Let's buy these t-shirts. Let's buy these pens. Let's buy this stuff. And then you get to where the rubber meets the road and you need to buy pizza for your volunteers and you're out of money. And it's because we didn't have a budget. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, I don't need a budget. I'm running a grassroots campaign or I'll raise as much as I need 
um, as I can and I'll spend it when I have it or I'll, I'll spend whatever it takes to win. If you spend whatever it takes to win, you're gonna be spending yourself into a hole that you can't dig out of. Um, one of my worst case scenarios ever, I had a student come up to me after her election when she was taking a fundraising training and asked, how do I fundraise for a campaign that's already ending? And I was like, what? She had taken out a second mortgage to win her race and then lost and was trying to figure out how to fundraise to pay off the second mortgage that she had taken to fund to pay off her race. Like, oh my goodness gracious, do not go into personal debt for your campaigns, or at least not that much personal debt. Uh, people that say, I'll win a grassroots campaign as a professional volunteer, because I spent most of my career working at nonprofits and then volunteering on political campaigns. When somebody told me it was a grassroots campaign, that was often code for, we're not going to feed you. We don't have any money for gas cards, but we're going to ask you to drive 30 miles to go door knocking. Well, 30 miles there, 30 miles back, that's 60 miles. That's, you know, two, three gallons of gas right now. That's 16, $17. It kind of gets very expensive. And so we want to make sure that you're treating your volunteers, that you're treating your, your if you've got any paid staff, that you're treating them correctly, that you're, you've got the stuff you need to win. And we do that by setting our budget. So let's talk about why, what the benefits are of having a budget. Your budget works with your strategy, works with your calendar, works with your campaign plan. All of these things, the strategy feeds into the budget, the budget feeds into the strategy. Calendar, same way, plan, same way. When you're starting a budget, I want you to look at election day and say to yourself, what types of things do I need on election day? Do I need yard signs to put out at the polling places? Do I need t-shirts on my volunteers who are going to be working outside? Do I need lunches for anybody that's going to be inside watching the ballots being cast and, and making sure that they, the election is full of integrity? If so, you put those down on your sheet and you assign prices to them all. And when you're assigning the prices, I want you to be talking to actual contractors, look up actual prices of things and find out who's got the best most competitive prices. And also what are their deadlines and their turnarounds? Because you might find somebody who's really, really cheap, but it takes them three or four months to print things. Well, that doesn't do you any good on a campaign. So it's not just who's the cheapest, but who's the best and most efficient for what you wanna do. Um, anyway, you start with election day and then you work your way backwards to today. For example, do you want mailers going out the weekend before election day, just reminding last minute reminder of how to vote, when to vote, where to vote to actually vote for your candidate and vote all the way down and flip it over and make sure you go onto the back and vote for the candidates on the back. Um, are you going to be doing mailers on um, when the early ballots go out, when, the, when early vote starts or when absentee ballots go out? Are you going to be doing any door knocking? All of those things need to go on because they all got time frames in which you need the, th the, the print pieces, the, the paid pieces, the, the money that's going out. Um, for example, you want to make sure that you're leaving something at the doors as you go door knocking, because otherwise you're going to knock on a door, you're going to talk to somebody, the moment you leave, they've forgotten your name already, or the name of your candidate. So make sure you have that stuff in your budget that it's planned for. And again, start on election day, move backwards towards today. Um, the budget frees up your, your volunteer, your staff, your, your activists, your consultants to figure out how and when and where they can spend money and what they can spend money on. It is a roadmap. It also frees you from making the day-to-day -day decisions. Is it in the budget? Yes, move forward. If it's not in the budget, don't move forward. Is it in the budget and we've got the money in the bank to do it? Move forward. If it's not in the budget, we're not moving forward. If it's not in the bank yet, I need to get on the phone and start fundraising, right? Because you're the candidate and you're responsible for the fundraising. Um, by the way, when you're getting those estimates of prices, usually we say put a 3% buffer on it. With inflation the way it is right now, put a 10% buffer on it. I would rather you overestimate the costs and then have extra money that you could spend later than underestimate the cost and have to find more donors for things that you need now. Um, monitor and control the budget gives you the ability to monitor and control and make sure that that things aren't going crazy um 
For example, I know of one campaign that always bought the most expensive pizza because it was the pizza that, that the staff liked the best. Maybe you don't need the expensive pizza with all of the toppings every single night. I'm not saying only, only get cheats and I'm not saying only buy from Little Caesars pizza pizza. I'm just saying you could monitor and control. There was one night when I was working on the Trump campaign where I volunteered, I told all my volunteers that if they came in on a Friday night and stayed until nine o'clock, I would buy them steak dinners. And I did. But did we do that every single night? Absolutely not, because it was only in the budget to do it once. That so was a special thing that we did. Um, what else about budgets? It provides monthly fundraising goals. So you know exactly how much you need to fundraise now to pay for next month. And you need to know, you know how much you need to fundraise next month to pay for the following month. So it keeps you on track as the candidate as far as reaching your fundraising goals. And then if you reach those fundraising goals, you can start fundraising above and beyond what's in your budget because now you can have more advertising, more marketing, or if you get enough money into your accounts, you can spread it around and share it with candidates that maybe are struggling a little bit and try to get some more candidates elected so you're not alone on the board. Um, Again, the, can, the budget allows the, the candidate to step away from the day-to-day -day operations and concentrate on what they're supposed to do. Quickly, type into the chat, what is a candidate supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be doing three things. Tell me what those are. Um, the budget also allows candidates to handle helpful advice. You know, when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, by the way, every campaign that I know of has bought these fingernail files. The parents love them. Everybody always needs a fingernail file. You could buy mine for only 30 cents each. Can I set you down for a thousand? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I would love to get your fingernail files, but it's just not in my budget. I apologize. I wish I could help you out. I wish you could help me out. I would love those fingernail files. They're great, but they're not in my budget. So I'm not allowed to buy any. Actually, I had somebody once come to my campaign office and try to sell me a $5,000 vacuum cleaner. $5,000. And his reasoning was, well, you can take it home after the campaign and the campaign's got plenty of money. Campaign does not have money for a $5,000 vacuum cleaner. And I wasn't about to be taking a resource like that home and passing it off as if it was my own. Uh, don't forget to put voter outreach and marketing into your budget. These prices, you can, you can lock in the prices by buying early. You can figure out how much you need, when you need it, you can also work with people with consultants who are media buyers who can help you figure out how to place the best Facebook ads, how to place the best television or radio ads if that's the direction you're doing. Um, and these people will help you spend efficiently. But again, if it's not in your budget to do Facebook ads or to do um, paid text messaging, peer-to-peer -peer text messaging, you're not gonna be able to do it because again, if it's not in your budget, you won't have it fundraised for, you won't be able to pay for it. Um, your, your principles, we want you to budget conservatively, which means think about how many you think you need and then add on some overages, add on numbers. So if you think you only need um, 500 door hangers, go ahead and budget for 700. Those extra 200 are going to come in handy either because you end up doing a parade and now you need something to hand out at the parade or you're going to be, you know, passing them out on election day, or at least if you planned for 700 and you budgeted for, or if you plan for 500 and you budget it for 700, then you've got extra money there. Or God forbid, if the price of paper goes up again, or you need to add a rush charge to it because of the print, something changed in your race and you want to do an emergency print piece, You've already covered the overages by overestimating the number you need and or the prices that they should be. Again, it says add a 3% buffer here. I'm recommending a 10% buffer to my students right now just because of the way that inflation has been going so crazy over the last year. I want you to work with real numbers when at all possible. So call up those the mail house. Find out how much it is to have them pre-sort and mail your piece with the red label. Uh, the red label meaning that you get a third class postage rate, but first class service. Um, because if you send it without that, if you send it third class, you don't always arrive or arrive on time. Um, maybe you do want to send some of your pieces first class because then it's guaranteed to arrive. 
There's lots of different ways that you can send mail, send your pieces, lots of different prices. That's why you need to talk with some of these professionals in the business to figure out exactly how to figure out how much it's going to cost you to use these services and get these things done. Um, get detailed vendor quotes. So if somebody is quoting you today, oh, well, we can print those pieces for this amount uh, at this rate and whatever else, and you lock it in on a contract basis, and then they come back and say, oh, well, it's going to be more. You now have a signed contract with a quote saying, nope, it was supposed to be this amount, not that amount. And work with your vendors to make sure that the their prices aren't going up and you can place those 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 um, orders as early as possible. So even if your graphic design isn't ready, you can tell your print house, hey, we're going to go to print on this in two weeks. Go ahead and buy the paper now. And that way you can get the paper at a lesser price, especially with the way uh, the inflation is going up right now. Um, don't forget other things on your budget like staff and then minor costs. Are you going to be giving away gift cards as rewards for your best volunteers? Are you going to be buying them granola bars and water bottles to keep them going out and door knocking in the heat of summer? These little things, these little costs do add up. And like, I'm shocked. I know I keep mentioning inflation. I am shocked. The other day I was in a grocery store. I was in Rhode Island and it was $9, $8.99 for a 12 pack of Coke. My brain about exploded. I could not believe I was going to be paying $9 for a 12 pack of Coke. Um, so again, if you know the prices and you plan for it, you're covered. I wasn't prepared to pay $9 for a 12 pack of Coke. It's in our budget. We can do it. But it was just a shocker to me how much expenses have gone up. And you think something like a minor cost, a can of Coke doesn't add up. But when you figure each can of Coke is now almost a dollar and you're feeding your volunteers 20, 30, 50 cans of Coke a week, that adds up really, really fast. And it used to be something that was minor and a second, didn't even have to give it a second thought. Now make sure that, that those, those things are in your budget. The budget is only effective if it includes all of your expenditures. So really sit down with your friends, with your family, with your advisors, with your consultants, whoever is helping you on this campaign and go through and think about what do I need? When do I need it? What expenses might pop up? What cool things do I want to add? You know, are you going to do magnets for the side of your car? Put it in the budget. Are you going to do bumper stickers? Put it in the budget. Are you going to do stickers for people that are walking in parades or passing out along the parade route? Put it in the budget. If it's not in the budget, you, you don't get to buy it. Okay. Um, timing is important. Uh, Early in the campaign, you're working on getting the word out, letting people know who you are, telling your story. So that's going to be website, literature. Maybe you buy your signs early. Later in the campaign is when you really have to make sure that people are aware that they're voting for you. So that's when you do the more expensive paid voter outreach, whether that's Facebook advertising or radio, if you're lucky. I heard um, some radio ads this weekend on for campaigns and candidates across the country as I was traveling and doing my thing. So there's always ways to get the word out. Um, you might need to rely on paid voter contact such as paid door knockers or even giving door knockers a reward if they hit so many doors in a day. Those are things that again, if they're in your budget, you're good, but you've got to account for the ebb and flow of the, of the um, of the campaign cycle, you're going to be doing more door knocking as the campaign gets draws to an end than you are, for instance, right now in during the heat of the summer. Um, however, during the heat of the summer, you can be out door knocking later. So maybe it all balances out. It, every campaign plan is different. You need to figure out what your campaign looks like, campaign plan looks like, and then that campaign plan will dictate what your budget looks like. As I said, every campaign is different. Your race is unique to you. Uh, expenditures increase as election day comes closer. Voter outreach needs to be the biggest part of your, your budget. If you're spending more money on fancy furniture for your office that you're only going to have around for three weeks, for three months, 
and you're not spending that money on voter outreach, you're doing it wrong. So make sure that you are uh, putting in the time, the money, the effort to balance that budget out. And of course, as I said, small expenditures do add up and do add, add up fast. So how much do you spend on your team? Remember, the more that you spend on administration, the less you're spending on paid voter outreach. So if you've got consultants that you're hiring, the more you're spending on consultants, the less you have to spend on the paid voter outreach. Now, in some cases, consultants are worth their weight in gold because they're giving you discounts and hints and tips and you're, they're making you more effective at voter outreach. But other times, it's just extra bodies sitting around telling you what to do instead of actually doing the voter outreach. If your staff is engaged in actual voter outreach, if they're door knocking, if they're phone calling, then that's those are the people that you want to spend money on because those are the ones actually out there asking for um, for votes. By the way, the three things that candidates should be uh, working on, asking for votes, asking for money, asking for volunteers, right? Don't forget your workers. I am a campaign volunteer. This is what I do. It's how I got my start. I started off by going out there and door knocking. Um, so my heart and soul is with the campaign volunteers on every campaign that I've worked on. In some way, I have been involved with the volunteers in trying to get um, voter outreach going and working with those volunteers, working with the voters. If I show up to volunteer at your campaign and you're not paying me money, not sorry, not paying me money, and you're not feeding me, if you're not giving me granola bar and you're not giving me a bottle of water before I go out the door, guess what happens? I get to my location. I start door knocking. It's 85 degrees outside. Oh my gosh, it's so hot. 15 minutes in, I want water. 30 minutes in, I need water. So an hour in, I take a break, I drive over to the 7-Eleven, I buy myself a nice cold bottle of water, and I look around and, oh my gosh, there's a protein bar. That sounds good too. I got to keep hydrated, right? I got to keep my electrolytes up. And then I sit in the car while I eat and drink and enjoy the air conditioning for just a little bit longer. Then I go out and door knock some more, and then I go back and I have to go buy yet another bottle of water because I finished my first. So instead of door knocking for four hours, maybe I'm door knocking for an hour, taking a break for 30 minutes, door knocking for 45 minutes, taking a break, door knocking a little bit, coming back to the office. Whereas if you had fed me and hydrated me, cheap, 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 right? I would have these resources in my car. I wouldn't have the excuse to get in, turn on the air conditioning. I wouldn't stop door knocking. I would stop, take a break, get my water and go back at it. So really that food, taking care of your volunteers is huge. And then after I get done, when I come back to the, wherever we're gathering or to the campaign office, um, when I come back, if you're not feeding me dinner, I'm probably not showing up again. Back when I was young, when I was fresh out of college and I was door knocking, the reason why I was door knocking on so many political campaigns was I was too poor to buy food. A uh, dirty little secret. I was working for a nonprofit. I was getting paid peanuts. And at the end of the month, I had $20 left over. That was after I bought, you know, food and gas and everything else. So if I could save money by eating at a campaign office, at the end of the month, I had $120 left over and I could buy things and it was great. So I, that's why I volunteered on campaigns was because they were feeding me dinner and saving me money. Make sure you take care of your volunteers, especially the young ones you have to have collateral. I have a love-hate relationship with, with yard signs. I love them because they get the name out, they, they spread the word, they make it look like people are supporting you. I hate them because candidates are like, oh my gosh, look at my yard signs everywhere. I'm going to win. I don't have to do any more work. No, yard signs don't actually vote. So make sure that, that you are buying collateral, but you're using it intelligently. Do we put yard signs at the end of a cul-de-sac? No, why? Because nobody sees the end of the cul-de-sac except the cars that live down there. Um, where you wanna put the yard signs are at big intersections or heavily traveled roads. So what does collateral look like? It is the lit, the palm cards that you're giving out at the door or at the, at the parades and the other places where you've been. It's your yard signs, the sticker, the business cards, the t-shirt, the buttons, the pens, all of this stuff. Um, do we buy pens first? Absolutely not. 
not unless you want to be a loser. The pens are extra. When you've fundraised above and beyond and you've gotten all the other stuff on this list, then you could buy the pens and the nice things, okay? Um, some things about collateral. Collateral only supports your effort. It does not win elections. It does make you look like you're a professional candidate who has their act together. I'm getting ready to vote in Prince William County. I get the vote in the seventh congressional district this year in Virginia. Um, so I'm getting ready to vote and I've got to look at who I'm voting for. I've got one candidate that called and did a push survey. I've got one candidate who was called twice now, had a volunteer called twice now to ask me to vote for them. That same candidate has put three pieces of, of literature in the mail to me. I really, really, really am torn because I know who I wanted to vote for, but that person hasn't reached out and asked for my vote. I haven't seen them do any online campaigning. I haven't heard their name anywhere. I have not seen anything. I wanted to vote for this person, but it doesn't look like they're running a professional campaign. And if they're not running a professional campaign in the primary, they're not going to be able to run a professional campaign in the general election. So as much as I really want to vote for my favorite candidate, I'm definitely not voting for my favorite candidate because they're not campaigning. So make sure that you've got the things that you have to run the professional campaign to say to the people, I'm a legitimate candidate. You should come and vote for me. Okay. Um, what does, what else about collateral? Make sure you order plenty of literature. You don't want to run out. Um, this happened, this funny story about that. So the first day we went door knocking on the, the Trump campaign, we had no literature. They couldn't send us enough because it was already sent to other states, but they wanted us out door knocking. So we just printed off pages from his website and we had black and white print offs from his website and we were going door to door. And I thought it was the hokiest, worst thing I had ever done. I was so embarrassed. And at the first door, the guy was like, wow, Donald Trump is saving money by printing in black and white. That's amazing. He's really got his finger on the budget. I was like, oh my gosh, this is working for Donald Trump. Will it work for you to print off black and white pages from your website to pass out? Probably not. So please don't do it. Even though I just told you that somehow or another it worked for my campaign with Donald Trump. Um, I want you guys to look professional. I want you to look credible. I want you to re look realistic. So make sure you've got plenty of literature Make sure that you've got signs for homes and for polling places and at events. Um, you want to minimize the number of orders. So you, so because every time you order, there's like setup fees and delivery fees and all this other stuff, right? So if you minimize the number of orders and you just buy in bulk, then you can use the lit as you need it and spread it out. And you only have to order once and you save money. So this means that maybe in the primary, you don't put the date of the election printed on your piece. You have your print piece ready to go so it can be used both in the primary and the general election, assuming you have a primary. Um, your yard signs, don't put the date of the election on your yard sign. Um, it's, unless you're running in a, a special election or a very off election, Everybody's going to know when the November election is by the time that the November election comes. So you don't have to put the date on your yard signs. Plus, if you win, sorry, when you win, you can take those yard signs and use them again two years later when you run again, unless the date's on them. So don't put the date on your yard signs. There we go. Um, in, the in the 21st century, we're going to be doing digital campaigning. You need to have a website. Your website needs to look professional. It doesn't need to be expensive, but it does need to look professional. It doesn't need to be extensive on every single issue. As a matter of fact, the more you explain your positions, the more you're opening yourself up to criti critiques, crit critics, critics, that's the word. The more you're opening yourself up to critics, if you leave it general, you're better off. Uh, this past weekend, I had um, a woman, I asked her what, what her top issues were. She was running for state Senate, which I know is a little different than school board, of course, but I asked her what her top issues were. Now we were right outside of Washington. She said, I am very much concerned with the homeless population. I'm looking for new solutions to make sure we get people off the street. So fantastic. I said, stop talking. 
And I explained that as me, as a conservative, I would apply one set of issues to her, to her answer and think, oh my gosh, this woman's on my side because she answered that way. A, a moderate might apply a different set of solutions to her answer and think, oh my gosh, she's on my side. So if you don't go deep into the responses, you open yourself up to a wider crowd that's going to be able to um, answer yourself. So you don't wanna go super deep with the issues on your website. Um, same thing with social media. With social media, the posts, um, I know you guys are gonna get training on that, but I want you to, if you're gonna be paying for social media posts, you're not going to get likes. I don't want you paying for likes because the likes are not votes. What I want instead is for you to do a paid advertisement that's a poll or tell me your opinion. Um, and then you get people into the poll, which is actually just a Google form or some other um, way of collecting their name, their email address, their zip code and their age, maybe their phone number as well. Once you get their name, their zip code, and their age, you can identify them in the vote database. And you can ask them on the poll, how do you feel about CRT in schools? How do you feel about um, transgender and uh, punishing kids for misnaming or mispronouncing people? You can ask questions on this, get their answers, and then take their answers, apply it to the voter database, and now you've identified voters. That is a good use of social media. Plus, once you've identified voters as being on your side, what else did you collect? Their email address their, and their phone number. So now you can reach out to them and ask them to volunteer for you, to donate to you, and make sure that they're voting for you. Um, if you're going to spend money on every, anything, you know, some people say, well, I could put up a website myself, Wix or whatever else. Absolutely. Make sure you have a professional designer design your logo. I have had so many people come up to me and say, hey, what do you think of my logo? And I have to smile and go, wow, that's, um, that's, that's nice. Um, a professional designer will take what you're doing on Canva or what you're doing on Word or Paint, and it's going to just add dimension, add color, add values to it that I can't even explain because I'm not a graphic designer. I can lay something out and be like, this is what I'm imagining. And then I hand it over to the graphic designer and they make it come alive and make it expand beyond my wildest dreams. So go ahead and spend a little bit of money on a graphic designer right at the very beginning to get your logo and your lit done correctly. By the way, your lit should have fewer words, more pictures, and the pictures should be telling stories. If you're running for school board, it should be you with kids talking to parents you know, enter, reading to the kids. I want action pictures on your lid that say you care about kids. Um, keep in mind, you need seven to eight touches to win. So whether that's television, mail, radio, telecom, digital ads, uh, the least expensive are going to be the digital ads. And then telecom gets a little bit more expensive. Mail is a little bit more expensive. TV is the most expensive, right? Um, and your, I, your goal is to achieve a solid frequency. So whenever you start hitting them, make sure you keep hitting them. I had somebody explain it like a drum beat. And each time you touch the voter, oh, you can't say touch the voter anymore because Joe Biden ruined that. Every time you reach out and communicate with a voter, it's a drum beat. And so you wanna start hitting the voters in such a way that you're doing it constantly and consistently. And suddenly they start tapping their feet and nodding their head and dancing to your, the to the tune that you're beating out and you're going to dance them right on in to the voting booth where they're going to vote for you in the election right so make sure and the other thing you don't want to do is go dark if you're like running ads and then suddenly you stop running ads right before election day you've gone dark because you ran out of money that's bad that's very bad because people will forget who you are or think oh my gosh maybe they dropped out of the race um, so make sure that once you start the ads, starting the voter contact, you keep it going at a consistent basis. Again, voter outreach mail, print and cost vary. It's anywhere from 40 cents a piece to $100.50. Um, Robocalls are only five cents a piece. Talk to te or peer-to-peer -to -peer texting is seven cents a piece. If you want to do... Um, 
images with that or video with that, it's a little bit more. So keep that in mind and watch for that. Um, with digital ads, um, local campaigns, you might spend $250 to $500 a month. The great news is, is with the digital ads, you can set it so that only people in your district are receiving the ad. I don't care if people outside the district are getting your ad, unless your ad is one to actually fundraise. If you're doing an ad that is intended to fundraise, then yeah, send it out wider than your district. But if you're just trying to get people inside your district to know you, trust you, and vote for you, you can lay out the lines of where you want this to hit. And anytime anybody who lives within those lines gets the messages. It's really quite cool the way that they can do this stuff. Um, so what do you do? You just take it step by step. You're going to stick to your budget. You're going to raise the money to fund the budget and you don't spend money until it's fully funded. And you use the budget as your minimum for your fundraising goal for the next month, for next month. So this month, I'm raising this as my minimum for June. And in June, I'm going to raise this as my minimum for July. And in July, I'm going to raise this as my minimum for August. And in August, this is my minimum for October. And you see it gets more expensive each month because we're doing more voter contact each month. And the vast majority of our campaign budget should be on voter contact. Um, so when do you adjust? When you adjust the moment that you realize you're off budget. You don't want to run out money. You don't want to go dark. You don't want to be prepared to print pieces and then realize you have no money to actually send the piece out. Um, and you don't want to leave money in the bank. Like you don't want to get to the end of the campaign and have an extra $5,000 where you could have done one more mailer or one more big sign or whatever it is and go, darn it, I could have won if I had just spent that more wisely. So adjust as soon as you know um, that things are off. And that way it also makes up and changes over time. If you know that suddenly everything is, is because of inflation, more expensive than what you thought it would be, you can go ahead and add on those expenses in the future months and start fundraising more for now. Um, what does it take to win? In reality, it takes money to win. It takes effort to win. It takes consistently asking people to donate to your campaign to win, um, but sticking to the budget. You don't want to just be throwing money out the window because in the end, you're like, what did I just spend that money on? I have no clue. So stick to your budget as you go. Uh, closing thoughts on budgets. Um, price out the options, especially for the voter outreach stuff. Hold you, your campaign, your vendors accountable to the budget. If it's not on the budget, you don't get to buy it and only share your budget when absolutely necessary because the budget will tell your opponents what your campaign, campaign plan is. A smart person like me can look at anybody's budget and be like, oh, here's what you're doing and here's how you plan on winning because the budget dictates the campaign plan. The campaign plan dictates the budget. They work hand in glove, right? And again, budget conservatively. Um, any questions on budget before we go on? Sandra, I am so jealous that it's 100 degrees there in Arizona. I'm excited because it's about to get up to 90 degrees in Virginia. I love the summertime and the heat. Um, seeing no questions on budget, let's go on to fundraising. I want you to watch this little clip. Yes, this is Huma Wiener doing a fundraising call. But I wanted you to watch, look to see where her cell phone is. Look to see where her computer is. Look to see whether or not she's playing Wordle. Um, look to see who else is in the room and what their jobs are. And let's type in some of those thoughts for me, okay? It's Huma. How could you tell my voice? I haven't talked to you in a year. How is the engagement? I want all the details. Uh, what yeah, is perfect direct. engagement? Well, that's good. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Well, he's working very hard. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. Have a nice, uh, have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. All right, he'll max, his wife is going to max out, and he'll try to raise under five. He's like, you know, I've never wow. given a raise in my life. Okay, so the funny thing is, I can't actually hear what was on the video today because of the setup in here. But I know this video well enough. I know that the guy is going to max out, his wife is going to max out, and then he's going to find other people who are going to donate to the campaign. Um, how did she start the call? 
Did she start the call directly diving in? Anthony's running for mayor and we need you to give us money. Or yeah, focus. Richard just said it was a focused conversation. She readjusted and reset the relationship, right? How are you doing? How did you know it was me? How was the engagement? Oh, what a perfect engagement. And then I'm sure she asked about the wedding as well, because now it's not only the man is giving, but his wife is giving, right? Um, so there's that. You'll notice she, she does have a landline phone. It's a cordless, but it's a landline phone. There's no screen in front of her. She's got a piece of paper that has the information about this donor in front of her, who the donor is, what their past giving is, how much we think they can give, um, who the wife, the spouse is. All of these things are probably on that piece of paper, where they work, when they were last together, what they last talked about. And you only get that type of information by recording it. If you'll notice the girl in the back of the room, she's probably sitting there recording notes and taking notes on the conversation. Um, no computer in front of Huma. She can't play Wordle. She can't play Hurdle. She can't play Quirtle. There's nothing to distract her. She's not on Facebook. She's not worried about anything except concentrating on what the man is saying on the phone. I'm sure that when she actually got to the parts where they cut out about Anthony and about his run for office, um, she probably asked some questions. The questions I like to ask when I'm fundraising are, you know, I'm fundraising for this candidate. What are your biggest concerns or what would you like that person to accomplish when they get into office? Because I want you to keep in mind, everybody tells me, oh my gosh, I can't ask for money for myself. I can ask for money for anything, but I can't ask for money for yourself. You are not asking money for you. You are asking money for the why. Why are you running? Quick, somebody type in why they're running. Tell me a why. Why are you running? For the group that I was with last weekend, they had the kids, they were threatening to remask the kids. They had, the kids were masked until like March of this year. And now the numbers are starting to creep back up again. And they're saying, well, we're going to mask the kids. And they're still discussing out in Washington state whether or not they are going to mandate the vaccines for the children. The woman who hosted me, her husband, now has vascular issues specifically because of the vaccine. His military doctor is signed off saying the vaccine caused this. It's the only change that's been in his life. So she's like, I don't want my children being permanently harmed because of this vaccine, right? So she is not raising money for herself. When she goes in to raise money, she can say, I am raising this. I am trying to stop the vaccine mandates for the children. I don't want the children harmed by these vaccines. Will you give money to my efforts to stop the vaccine mandates? She's not asking for herself because the only way we stop the vaccine mandates is getting her on school board, right? Um, Joni's running because it's just too crazy out there. I need you to get more specific, Joni. What is your why? Why are you running? Uh, Richard is running for fiscal responsibility. Okay, so Richard, if I were sitting down, whoopsie, hold on, let me go, whoops, let me go back to where I was. Sorry, I was trying to go up in the, the budgets here or in the, the comments here. Um, so if I were, Richard, if I were sitting down with, with somebody and speaking, and I were you, the conversation might go like this. So I'm like, knock, 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 or I'm, you know, I'm, on the phone, ring, ring, ring. I'm talking to the, let's say, a, a, a business owner. Hi, um, Fred, it's so talk, so nice to talk with you. I'm Dina. You know, I've used your plumbing service for years. Look, I'm going to be running for school board, and I just wanted to find out with the school board, what are your top issues? And then I'm going to sit back and I'm going to listen. And if he mentions the taxes that they're paying, which Fred happens to be my dad. Yes, he is a plumber. It is very likely that dad, that Fred will be talking about the financial issues because they have very few school kids in their school and they want to shut down that school and merge it in with another school board so that they can pay less in taxes. Not just so that they can pay less in taxes, but the kids can get a better education, right? It's a waste. The school district that my parents happen to live in is absolutely a waste of time and money because of the number of kids in the school district and that are failing out. So let's merge it in with the other, get the kids into the better schools and um, um, stop doing this. 
So I would listen to him express those concerns and then I would be able to pair it back. Yes, I too am concerned about the taxes that we've been paying and the raising of the property taxes. I think it's absolutely insane that we keep raising property taxes for a school that's failing and for so few kids in the school district. I am running because I literally want to put myself out of business. I want to put my this, this school board out of business. When I get on that school board, I'm going to do everything in my power to shut that school board down, to close the school and to merge it in with the other districts. Will you give to my campaign? I need $100 from you today in order to buy yard signs. I need $100 from you today in order to buy literature so I can start door knocking. Can I count on you for $100? And that's how you make that, that fiscal responsibility. There's not a lot of feeling to fiscal responsibility. Actually, it sounds very self-serving. I want to get on school board so I can cut my taxes. Ugh, don't you care about the children? The children need the new school, right? Um, so be careful about the fiscal responsibility, but find ways to make it relevant to the people that you're getting, um, that you're getting to support you. Um, to create school policies that are uh, uh, focused and academic, to keep CRT out of the schools, to maintain integrity of our district and the new superintendent. Okay, um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, increase academic uh, performance, remove politics from the classroom and restore parental authority. So if I were making this calls, again, it would be what are your most, what are your biggest concerns? If I were talking to Sandra, she just gave me three. What are your biggest concerns? She'd be like, look, I'm really concerned about the academic performance. I want to remove politics in the classrooms. I think it's crazy out there with the CRT and everything else. And I think parents need more authority. Absolutely. Look, even though I am not a parent, I absolutely believe in parental responsibility um, and parental authority. I will listen to the parents. This is an issue that's been close to my heart. I've been working with parents. I am the aunt of two kids in the school district. And even though their parents don't have the time and energy to run, I do. And the reason why I'm running is because I can see that they are not being taught in the same way that I was being taught when I went to the school district. We need to get back to the basics. We need to stop worrying about pronouns and about who's a racist and who's not a racist and actually treat the kids equally because separate but equal doesn't work. Instead, we need to tell kids, all the kids that they have the ability to achieve if they just work for it. And then we work on getting that academic achievement up by focusing on the basics, getting back to phonics, getting back to math and teaching math at younger and younger ages when it's age appropriate so that we can do more and more advanced math as they progress and proceed. I think that we need to have homework back in schools so that the parents are working with the kids to make sure their homework gets done and know exactly what's going on in the classrooms. When kids come home from school and they don't have homework, then you know that they're hiding something from the parents because the, the kids aren't taking the lessons home and showing the parents, here's what I did in school today. That needs to be restored. That parental responsibility, that parental uh, authority and the education prowess. Will you, Sandra, will you donate $100 to my campaign? Sandra says, yes, she hasn't done her software, hasn't done homework in two years. Sandra, are you going to give to my campaign so I can help the kids? See, I'm not asking you to give to me. I'm asking you to give to my campaign. So let's talk about this for a little bit. What did I just do there in reality? Whoops, come on. Next slide. Thank you very much. Um, fundraising is the single most important factor that separates winners from losers. If you can't raise money, you can't win votes. If you're not asking for dollars, you're not going to get dollars. So you can't just say, will you support me? Zach, will you support my campaign? He's like, yes, way to go. I'm giving you this lesson so you can learn how to, how to win your campaign. I support you. But that support doesn't go anywhere. I need money in order to pay the volunteers and in order to pay my bills, in order to print the pieces, to get the mail sign, the, the yard signs out, right? So make sure you're asking for what you want. And then what you want is dollars. It is 90% effort and 10% network. But that being said, where do you start? You start with your network. Right now, if you have not done so already, tonight, today, as soon as we hang up, I want you guys to start writing out a honest and Excel spreadsheet. Just put down names of every person you know who you will ask for for money. Start with your parents, then go to your siblings, 
then go to your aunts and uncles, go to your cousins, go to your fraternity brothers, your sorority sisters, the people you went to high school with, the college with, who's in the parents group with you. Just keep building those circles. Who do you work with? Who is on Little League with you? Who, who is um, Little League coaches with you? Which, whose kids do you know that are in uh, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts? All of these places. Who goes to your church? Put down those names. I want you to have a list of 100 names of people that you are going to start asking money from, right? And the next thing you do in the next column, you start putting down their phone numbers. And then you start putting down how much you think they make so you can write down how much you think they can get. The other thing you need to know, by the way, is what is the campaign finance law say? How much money are you allowed to ask for? What is the maximum somebody can give to your campaign? Um, if you happen to know what their issues are, write down their issues. My dad's number one issue is pro-life. He is, he advertises on the Catholic radio station as the pro-life plumber in Cincinnati, right? So if I were writing down, I would be talking about pro-life and how I want to keep the Planned Parenthood sex education out of schools, right? Um, if when I go to my Aunt Diane, her number one issue is academic standards, so I'm going to talk to her about academic standards. I'm not going to talk to her about pro-life. She also happens to be a little bit more liberal. So I'm going to be talking about supporting the teachers because we don't want to make enemies of the teachers. We want to be able to support the teachers. Uh, we just want to make sure that the teachers are doing their jobs to the best of their abilities. And what's their job? Teaching the kids with the academic standards. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, no, you have Melba, ask your kids, the kids in your district are going to get jobs across the country. So yes, you are absolutely asking all of your friends and family from across the country. If they care about you, they want you on school board. And if they care about their communities, they want you on school board. If they care about kids, they want you on school board. I give, I give to people from other states all of the time. I give to people from other areas of my state all of the time. All they have to do is reach out and ask. And also we already have to have a relationship. Please people don't look me up and start asking me for money, I'm poor. Um, but I want you to, don't be afraid to ask for people out of state because we are talking about the future. And if we can fix one school board and then another and then another and then another, then it puts pressure on all of the school boards. Watch the video of this. And keep that in mind. So somebody in California has asked, but why should I give to your campaign in Virginia Beach? It's because we are trying to change school boards and we have to do it one at a time. And then that puts pressure on the, the textbook manufacturers to make textbooks that can be sold to the rest of the country. And it fixes the textbooks in California. So really by giving to my school board, Grace, to giving to me, when I get on, I'm going to fix the school, the textbooks in my district which then puts pressure on those textbook manufacturers to fix them in your districts, right? Think about how big and how that works. Awesome, Melba, look at that. Uh, Zachary's got some good quotes there, comments there in the, uh, in the chat there. Um, I want you to make a commitment to raise money. I want you to make a commitment of how much time you're gonna put putting into raising money. And then the other thing I want you to do, I want you to go out and find, like look up on Amazon or wherever, I don't care, Find a picture of somebody running and winning a race with the word persist. Remember those old from the 1990s, the old um, posters, the, the motivational posters? They have done studies. And when a fundraiser sits in a room with a persist poster where somebody is running a race and winning the race and it just says persist, they make more calls and they raise more money and they call longer than when the poster is not there. So go ahead and make the investment, get the $15 and the cheap uh, frame from Ikea and hang that up in the room where you're going to, to, to um, call. And by the way, when I say the room that you're gonna call, look, they are in a room. They are not in their living room. They are not at their kitchen table. They are in a room that is closed off from the rest of the house. The child is not in the room. They are segregated away from other people so that they are not getting interfered with, right? And if you'll notice, he's got a rolling mat underneath his chair and she doesn't. 
I am willing to bet that they brought her table in just for this shot, for this image in the documentary. She probably has her own fundraising room and her own assistant, and they probably make fundraising calls at the same time from two separate locations. I do want you to have an assistant listening to you and helping you along the way, taking your notes. And then that person is the one that is filling out the envelope so that you can write the thank you note right then and there. Because once they say they're going to give, you're writing out the thank you note, right? So that you can put it in the mail. Um, that's the one that you transfer the phone to so that she can walk them through how to give online or to write down the credit card numbers so that you can start making your next call. Um, again, know your limits. I want you to be ethical. Avoid quid pro, quid pro quo. If you're talking to, and you should do a, a, a list of the stakeholders in your races. Who are the people that care about your race? And think about all of them. It's the parents and the grandparents, it's the taxpayers, but it's also who in the world is selling paper to the, the, the school board and who's selling the textbooks and who's selling the cleaning supplies and who's selling those cleaning services, right? Who sells the uniforms to the janitors? These are all stakeholders in your race and you should be calling up each and every one of them to see whether or not they would like to give a donation to you. But avoid the quid, quid pro quo. That's where they say, well, if you promise to sign a contract or support the contract with my janitor's uniforms, then I will give you a maximum donation to your campaign. No, nope, I can't promise that I will support the contract, but I do promise that I will be fair with the contracts, right? Um, so don't do the quid pro quo. As a matter of fact, if somebody makes you or asks you to make that comment, probably hang up on them and move on. Don't take the money. Um, um, if you find out that you've gotten money that you decide you don't like the source, like somebody gets arrested for something, give the money to charity as soon as possible and get a, a, a receipt from that charity so that you can show that you gave the money away. Um, I don't want to see you on the news as taking dirty campaign locate, uh, dirty campaign money, right? Um, think about which charities you fundraised for. Think about who has called you up for charitable donations. Call them back up. Reciprocity is one of the biggest reasons why people give. I gave to you for this. Now you're going to give to me for that. So if they've fundraised from you before, fundraise from them now. Okay. Your wedding list, your kids' school directory, I've already gone through a lot of those things. Make the plan. How many hours a week am I going to call? And make that commitment. Set that goal. Um, let's see what else here. And then ask other people to actually donate for you. Um, one last thing, we're at one o'clock, so I'm going to call it quits here, but I'm going to just put this out there on your finance plan. Figure out how much you need and when do you need it? And how much, how do you know how much you need and when you need it? Yeah, look at your budget and you always are doing it ahead of time, right? And then you're also readjusting your budget and you're readjusting your fundraising goals after the filing deadline, because then you know how many people are in the race. Um, one last, one last thing. I know I said one last thing. When you're making your ask. So I went through two possible asks, pretend to ask before. When I asked Sandra, will you give me $100 for my campaign to restore um, academic precision in the classroom? Sorry, I screwed up my words there, but you know, you get the gist. Then you shut up and you let Sandra make the decision. If you keep talking after you make the ask, it takes away the emphasis. It takes their brain off of the ask. Your brain will focus on what's important. And you're going to put out there what's important. The important thing is that we need to restore academic standards. And I need $100 towards my campaign to restore academic standards. Sandra, can I count on you for a $100 donation today to restore academic standards in our school system? So now her brain has equated academic standards and the $100 donation, and it's mulling it over. We don't know what she's thinking about, so just shut up. Let her think it. Your brain is automatically going to worst case scenarios. Oh my gosh, she doesn't want to give $100. She doesn't like me. We didn't make the connection, whatever. In her mind, she's going, okay, $100. Yeah, I can afford that, but that means I need to pay off this bill or that bill. Which credit card's got $100 on it right now? Do I have to run to the bank? Do I put it on a check? Which, 
which credit card does my husband want me to put this on? Right? So once, and, and Zach says this, once you get a yes, stop selling. Just shut up. Don't talk them out of voting for you. Don't talk them out of donating for you. You've already got them to agree to vote for you because of finances, right? They want tax cuts. You want tax cuts. They've agreed to give to your campaign. Don't talk about CRT. Don't talk about your pro-life position. Don't talk about academic standards. It doesn't matter to them. Shut up. Stop talking. Let them write out the check. Well, let them say yes. And then ask, do you want to give that by check or credit card today? We don't take cash. No, 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 no cash. Cash can't be traced. Cash is, is dangerous in politics. Cash is not king. Um, I've got heard horror stories of piles of cash, bags of cash showing up on people's doorsteps. They will call the cops and have the cops come and take it away because we don't deal with cash. We deal with credit card donations and we deal with checks. So would you like to write a check or would you like to make a credit card donation? And then as soon as they say, yes, which one, when can I count on you on making that donation? And then you thank them profusely and then you write out the handwritten thank you note and that goes in the mail today or in the mail when the, the check is received. Okay, that's all I've got for you guys today. Questions, Zach, you're back? I am back, yes, we have time for a few questions. I want to get to this one that was asked earlier. They've been very patient. I think I know the answer, but I want them to hear it from the source. Are you required to raise funds or can you use your personal money? Here's the deal with uh, raising funds versus raising personal money. Are you required to raise funds? No. Can you use your personal money? Yes. But when somebody gives you even a dollar to your, your campaign, they have now made a commitment towards helping you win. They have bought into your campaign. Plus, the more donors that you have, it shows the more support that you have. So are you required to use funds? No. You know, if you're a self-made billionaire and you want to finance your own campaign, that's fine. But just be warned, it may be a negative. Look, he's, a self, he's trying to buy the seat and he's got no friends and no family. Nobody's supporting him. Donald Trump was self-funding his campaign. He actually had more low dollar donors than Hillary and Bernie did. Why? Because he was out there asking for money and bringing in the money. I don't need your money, but if you want to give me money to support my campaign, to show you support me, please give me because we're running the best campaign. It's the best because we're making America great again. Why? Because I've got the best donors. I've got the best volunteers. I've got the best voters. So you guys give me money. We're going to run the best campaign. You guys do the same. Now, maybe not like Donald Trump did it, but go ahead and still ask for donations. Because even so, if you're like, okay, it's $10,000 and I'm going to donate $10,000 to my own campaign, but then you raise another five, dollars $10,000 in mid and low, low donations, or maybe even a big donation. Fantastic. Now you can spend $15,000 on your campaign and your people get to eat steak more often and they're happier and they keep coming back to volunteer some more. Mm -hmm.